So I want to I want to start the evening off by asking the question: Who remembers when they were younger? Now I'm talking when you were really, really, really young. A little bit older than what my daughter is, and a little bit younger than uh, going to primary school. It's when you kind of develop that attitude: I know everything. I can back chat my mom. I can back chat my dad. I can try and push the boundaries as far as I can. And every single time that I tried that, I would either get a hiding, or what we do with uh, our, our daughter now and put her in timeout. I don't know if that really works with anyone. Or you shout at them and be like, "Listen!" You point the finger, and then you get like our daughter does now. Stout. It's all wonderful and good, and we understand that. But there's certain rules and boundaries that we put in our house that Taya needs to listen to. Taya knows where the boundaries are at home. She knows exactly what she's allowed to do. She knows exactly what she's not allowed to do, and she still tries and does it, like playing with the washing machine door and buttons. But when we go and visit Grandma and Grandpa, I see I'm not the only one. Someone understands what I'm going through. It's not that they don't have boundaries themselves; they have boundaries, but they're not my boundaries. And when we go and visit, she tends to automatically just click and say, "I'm a Grandma and Grandpa." Daddy doesn't rule this area. Mommy, I don't have to listen to her. But Grandma and Grandpa, I listen to. And Simona has has a thing that she'll always say: if we if we say no at home for something, it's no. If she goes to Grandma and Grandpa, she will ask Omar for something. And if Omar wasn't going to give it to her, Simona always says this: her dad would turn around and say. You can't eat alone. Don't worry what Grandma said. Go and get one for me as well. But I want to take you to a little video clip that many of you may have watched before, where some child asked Grandma for a cupcake, and Mom said no. And listen to the dialogue that happens between mom and son. Like, listen to me, listen to me. Like, like I do this all the time. And if I go out at the at the house with the little girl, Matty has his toys, and then Matty has all his toys. Okay. But I have to yell at you guys. Okay, Linda, Linda, listen, Be- listen, 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 you- listen, listen, Linda. Listen, okay, what? Like everything they do at this house, they can't trust everything at Grandma's house. Okay. Okay, then what? Then you're not listening to me. Then you're not listening to me. I asked you not to do something. No, no, but listen to me. Look at if we do something, if you get that out, that bird thing off, you're gonna break it. Okay. But I'm asking, I'm letting you know but that you cannot, no, Linda, I'm, Linda, li- lick it, lick it. you're not listening to me. Linda, listen to me Linda, now. Lick it, lick listen to me listen now. To, listen to no, me. No, you're not listening. I said no cupcakes and you try to get cupcakes and you try to ask grandma. Linda, Didn't you? Linda, lick it, lick it, lick it. If we do something without this, if we, if we get closer, you can't even get them, you can burn your butt. What's going to burn your butt? You and Kevin don't listen. So I have to give both of you guys pop pals in your butt. But Linda, but Linda, but Grandpa's going to give you pop pals in your butt. No, he's not. Yeah. I have to, you want, you don't want me to hit Kevin or you don't want him to spank you? No. Why? Because anybody wants to spank me. And then I have to spank Kevin. But he's, still, but he's my little pop pops. He's your little pop pops, but he doesn't listen. But Linda, honey, honey, look at, look at this. Right oh, now, you can't do anything if we can't get everything out of the wall. If we can break everything down. I'm not breaking anything down. I'm just letting you know Linda, you cannot it, have it, cupcakes it, for it, dinner. Linda, 
Then the like this thing, I never belong to you. Anything you can get, anything and anything and anything. I'm done arguing with you. I'm not making it you. You need to listen to the things that I say because I'm the mom and I'm the no, adult. No, look at, listen to me. I'm just trying to get them. To no, yes. Every single one of us want to laugh. Every single one of us got a bit of a shock when he's like, honey. Because then I asked the question, where did he learn that from? The father says... You see, the thing is, we can identify with that because somewhere in our life, either we were there doing that to our parents, maybe not to that extent, let's be honest, or we've experienced it with our own children. They're doing that, but the Father has so many commands and, and, and directions that we have to give in our home that we need to take authority in our homes as well. And we forget that the same principle applies to God. He is the Father who says to us certain things. Fred Bachner says this, listen to your life. All moments are key. Listen to your life. All moments are key. Now, what he's basically saying there is, so often in our life, there are certain things that we're going to learn along the way that are either going to help us and aid us in our journey moving forward, or they're going to teach us on what we're not supposed to be doing. But everything that we go through, everything that we experience, is something that the Father wants to say to us. We just need to be willing to listen. Habakkuk is a beautiful story of this. And those who have never read the book of Habakkuk, I'm going to take you through it this evening. Because the book of Habakkuk is literally a man standing before God saying, listen, you made so many promises to me, saying to me that you are the God Almighty, you're going to stand in these circumstances, you're going to bring restoration to this, but I don't see you doing it. And he wrestles with God. In the second chapter, we're going to start reading through it now. In the second chapter, he gets to places like, okay, God, show me, listen, tell me what's going on. God gives him direction. And in the final chapter, God says, if you just listen to me then, you wouldn't have experienced all this heartache and this hurt and this pain. And you wouldn't have had to take three chapters to get you. But the father said, let us go and read Habakkuk 1. This is one to four to start this off. The oracle, a burdensome message, a pronouncement from God, which Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. O Lord, how long will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? For destruction and violence are before me. Strife continues and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ineffective and ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice becomes perverted. There Habakkuk turns around and says, God, no one's listening to what you've been saying. Why should I? But God brings a little bit of wisdom. If you just went a little bit further in the Psalms, Psalm 6, verses 1 to 10, it's a little bit long. I want you guys just to hear what he says. It's David writing to God. He says, please God, no more yelling. No more trips to the woodshed. Treat me nice for a change. I'm so starved for affection. Can't you see I'm black and blue, beat up badly in bones and soul? God, how long will it take you to let up? Break in, God, and break up this fight. If you love me at all, get me out of here. I'm no good to you dead, am I? I can't sing in your choir if I'm not buried in some tomb. I'm tired of all of this. 
so tired. My bed has been floating 40 days and nights on the flood of my tears. My mattress is soaked, soggy with tears. The sockets of my eyes are black holes, nearly blind. I squint and grope. Get out of here, you devil's crew. At last, God has heard my sobs. My requests have all been granted. My prayers are answered. Cowards, my enemies disappear. Disgraced, they turned tail and ran. David went through exactly the same thing that Habakkuk did, but David cried out. His heart poured out. He said, God, I'm going to trust you. I don't quite understand what I'm going through right now. I'm yearning to see you do something in the circumstances. But then God does something in the situation. David was faithful in prayer. And in the end, he saw the enemies flee. But there's another passage of scripture that highlights this in the New Testament. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8 says, Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who, op- for everyone who keeps, on receiving, or keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be opened. The Father says in every circumstance, keep being persistent. It's not the easiest thing to hear. Because persistence is never a strong will of our own. We want to have things happen now. Especially because of the day and age we live in, that everything is so instantaneously accessible. I can go onto Google, and if I want an answer for anything, I can get an answer. Now, I don't know how many of you have done this, because we tend to do quite a, quite a bit at our home. Instead of going to the doctor, I'm going to ask Google what Google thinks. And most of the time, Google gives me sort of the right answer. But when they give me the causes, I started getting a little concerned. Because 99%, they relate everything to cancer. And when I go into the doctor's rooms, I'm like, Google says I have cancer. Sort me out now. The doctor looks at me and he's like, that's not what I say. Just behave yourself. Listen to me. Let's work this out. We need to listen to those who are placing authority over us because sometimes... They just have a little bit more wisdom than we do. That's why God says, keep knocking at the door and I will open it. But he goes on later in that verse, in in verse 8, saying, carry on knocking. Be persistent. He's going to open up the right door for you at the right time when that door needs to be opened, but he's not going to open it before then. We need to be patient. Listen to the Father's voice and say, okay, God, what are you saying? What do you want to happen? This is exactly what happened to Habakkuk. Hear what happens in Habakkuk 2. I just want to make sure. I think I know. Habakkuk 2, verse 1. It says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the tower And I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what answer I will give as his spokesperson when I am reproved. Here Habakkuk comes to a place and says, okay, you know what, God? You won. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to stand watchful and see what your promises, what you've already declared over my life. What you declared is going to happen over the situation in this land right now. I'm going to be your watchman. I'm going to stand there and watch and hear what you're going to say to me. Not because he's being arrogant, but he wants to hear what the Father has to say. George Miller says, If we desire our faith to be strengthened, 
We should not shrink from opportunities where our faith may be tried. And therefore, through trial, be strengthened. When the Father says something, whether it's a command, whether it's a promise, whether it's direction, there is always something that happens afterwards. The scripture either says, but, or therefore, or wait, because God is pronounced that it's going to take a little bit from you as well. And that little bit is faith. I need to have faith to say, if God says he's going to come through in the, in the circumstance, I need to believe that what he says is going to be true in my life. If I know that he's given me a direction, I cannot waver away from it. I need to stick on that path knowing that he's going to take me to the end of it, no matter how difficult it becomes. Moses experienced it. Abraham experienced it. David experienced it. Jesus himself experienced it. When Jesus disappeared, the disciples were, where did you go? And Jesus' response is always this. I needed to go hear what the Father had to say. So let me ask you the question. What is God saying? Let me tell you what God said to Habakkuk. The Lord then answered and said, Write the vision and engrave it plainly on clay tablets, so that the one who reads it will run. For the vision is yet for the appointed future time. It hurries towards the goal of fulfillment. It will not fail. Even though it delays, wait patiently for it. Because it will certainly come. It will not delay. Now God has given him a command saying, wait. When I give you the vision, write it down on that tablet and hear what I've got to say. So that who gets to see it will also receive the promise. Psalm 27, 14 puts it so nicely. It says, wait for and confidently expect the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, Wait for and confidently expect the Lord. I love how it ends there. It's, like, it's, like, it's just like that anxious moment waiting to say, God is about to do something above and beyond your expectations. But I need you to wait. Waiting is the toughest part when the Father says. It's almost like when Taya runs into the, runs into the lounge. And you can see this look on her face. She knows where her sweets are. She knows exactly where and we, we call them nanas. And she will point to the kitchen and she'll just be like, nana, nana. She knows that that's what she wants. But in that moment, I need to make a decision whether it's okay for her to take it now or if it's not. Or if she's had too much, I need to say no. And she waits earnestly, expectantly of what I'm about to say to her. And she looks with me, those big brown eyes, like, Daddy, please give me what I want now. And when I turn around, I'm like, Taya, not now. It's like a whole world crashes down. Just like her world crashes down, sometimes our world crashes down because God hasn't answered us in the way that we expected, in the way that we wanted him to. But the reality is the Father knows best. Not us. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. says this. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. You just have to take the first step. Stanley Baldwin the British Prime Minister said this, I am one of those who would rather sink with faith than swim without it. 
both of those quotes that were taken from two iconic individuals all say that I don't need to know the entire picture. I just need to see what's right in front of me and take the first step. Because the Lord said, I need to do this. The Father commanded me to take this step. And they took it boldly. Everyone who succeeded, succeeded by taking small steps without seeing the entire picture. We don't need to see the entire picture. We just need to trust in the Father who says it. Ephesians 2, 4-5 says, But God, being so very rich in mercy because of His great and wonderful love with which He loved us, even when we were spiritually dead and separated from Him because of our sins, He made us spiritually alive together with Christ. For by His grace, His undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. In Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus looked at them and said, With people, as far as it depends on them, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, God has promises that he's given each and every single one of us. He says that I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I'll never let you go through anything alone without you feeling me with you or me holding your hand. I love the way that that person told the story that, of, the, of the footsteps in the sand. When, they, when he started taking his steps, he saw two sets of footprints. And eventually down, along the line on the beach... He looked behind and he saw one foot of footprints. And he turned around and he's like, God, why have you left me? Why are you not walking alongside me? But the Lord said, I haven't left you. I am the one carrying you during the hard times so that you don't have to do the hard work, but you're in my hands and I'm protecting you always. You see, someone gave this quote anonymously. If you think God has forgotten you, then you have forgotten who God is. Now, I don't know where you are right now. Some of you I'm, I've walked a journey with. Some of you I haven't. But the reality is each and every single one of us are on a journey. And on that journey, God has got certain expectations that he has of you. There's certain expectations that you have of God. There's certain promises he has made to you and there's certain promises that you've made to him. Think about those New Year's, New Year's resolutions that you made at the beginning of the year. How many of us can honestly say we stuck to all of them? Ninety-nine percent of us can say no. We haven't. And this is what happened to Habakkuk in the end. He came to a place where he realized that the Lord has said this, and I need to trust him on it. He has commanded me, he has called me, and I'm standing at this place justified. Because he has called me in this moment. And he goes on in Habakkuk 3.2, and he says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. He declares and he cries out to God, saying, God, I know of what you've done in Israel before. I know what you did with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Isaiah, all the great men of my time. Come and do exactly the same thing right now. I'm trusting you because you have said you will do it. And then he closes off the chapter from verse 18, from 16 to 18 and says, I heard and my whole inner self trembled. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay and rottenness entered my bones and I trembled in my place. 
because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade and attack us. Though the fig tree does not blossom and there is no fruit on the vines, though the though they healed of the olive fails and the fields produce no fruits, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no cattle in the stalls, yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation in the victorious God of my salvation. Yes, there are promises God has made and sometimes things don't go away that we expect them to. I do want to say that. But I stand here as a testimony of who God is. Because when I grew up, I had a father who, he wasn't a really great guy. A father who beat us, shouted at us, broke us down, never believed in us. He walked out of us when I was 14 years old and that was the last time I saw him. And I remember going back as a child, remembering what my father had said to me, I love you. I will always be there for you. I will move heaven and earth for you. And I remember questioning, asking, is love just a word? I read of this love that God says for us, is he going to do exactly the same thing to me as well? But then something amazing happened. I started identifying who the father really is. And what it means to be a father. I may fail every single day as being a father to my two girls. But he will never fail me as a godly father. He will continually teach me every single day how to be a godly father. As long as I am willing to listen. But it all comes down to me sacrificing my desires. And starting to listen to the father's voice. In everything he says. Because sometimes we have to accept that it's beyond our understanding right now and just keep going. I need to make the decision to run the race because the father said so. Tonight we're going to be asking a couple of questions around the table. And I want to create a moment for you to discuss them. Be a little bit real tonight. The Lord is saying stuff in your circumstances. He is saying things of where you're at now and where you're going through and where you're going to be. And these are the questions we're going to deal with tonight. The first one is what is God saying to you? The second one is what is God saying in your circumstances? And then, what is God saying about your future? It's tough to think about it right now, but I want you to just take a bit of time to really think about it. Because I struggled with these questions for a long time. I didn't know what God was saying for me. I knew what everyone else was saying that God was saying to them to tell me. But I didn't know what God was saying to me. I didn't know what God was saying about my circumstances, but until I started realizing that revelation, I started seeing my circumstances as a place of victory for him. And my future, it can be a troubling place. It can be easy to climb on a plane and move. It can be easy to say, listen, I'm done with this. But is that really what God is saying about my future? No. But that's the journey I'm going through. Let us chat a little bit around the table. Uh, we're going we're gonna to create a little bit of time for that. And there's going to be music playing in the background. But I really want you to answer these questions out of, the, out of the comments saying, the Father says this about me. The Father says this about my circumstances. The Father says this about my future. And there's enough paper for everyone to have their own. I want you to write it down for yourself and discuss it around the table. Because here's the thing.
Most of us are sitting around a table with his friends or spouses or someone I know. The person who's around your table, I want you to identify someone that's going to hold you accountable to that. Because what God says, the promise does not come to full, full view until someone starts holding me accountable to that. Because I can guarantee to you now, and I'm going to close off with this, that when you start writing this down and you start holding this close and you start holding to that, something is going to happen that the devil is going to try to turn you away from that, saying that's not what God said. Don't trust that. Look what happened to Eve. God said this for you as well. So let's take some time and spend some time chatting about it. So I trust that um, there's some good conversations happening around the table and uh, that you guys are challenging each other with what God is busy saying to you and what's going on. But this evening, we're going we're gonna to close off by taking what God says. And God said these important words to the disciples just before he was about to be crucified on the, on the cross. And they're all related to communion. He said to them, when you take of the cup and you drink of the wine, do this in remembrance of my blood that was shed for you on the cross because it washes over you and makes you righteous. Righteousness means that I'm in right standing with the Father. And he says, when you eat of the bread, do this in remembrance of my body that was broken for you. And what he was actually saying is that when his body was broken for you, he broke down the curses. He broke down the situations that are holding you back. He broke down every bondage to set you free so that you can stand free indeed. And that is why tonight we're going to go have communion. I'm going to encourage you to go to the table, bring it back, sit around the table together and do it together. And as you do that, keep these words in mind what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, take the first step in faith and you don't have to see the whole staircase. You just have to take the first step. So whatever you find yourself in, no matter whether it's for you, what God is saying about you, whether what He's saying in your circumstances, what He's saying about your future, speak life into that situation right now. As you take communion, let communion be a place where you can say, God, I'm victorious because of what you did. You say that I am righteous. You say that I am victorious in you. And I'm going to believe that from this day forward. So let us go and take communion and share it together. But before we go, I'm just going to pray for us. Father, we thank you that you're such a wonderful father that you sent your son to die on the cross for each and every single one of us. That tonight as we take communion and we, we celebrate the blood that was shed for us, we celebrate the body that was broken for us, we celebrate what it means for us because we stand in victory for what you have done and what you're busy doing in our lives. And we declare that victory, we declare that righteousness, we declare them to set us free in our circumstances, in our future, and what you're saying about us. Because you're the King of kings and Lord of lords and there is nothing that holds us back from those promises. Because your promises are true every single day of our lives. So thank you that we can share in communion. Thank you that we can do it freely. And thank you that it is not just a place of mourning, but it's actually a place of celebration because of what you are still doing every day in our lives. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen.